This is so topical right now. And if you are not aware of it as an investor uh, or a company, you are missing out on a huge portion of the dialogue that is happening right now. I think that's uh, a real opportunity for the resource sector to become that integral component in the supply chain, which really changes the world as far as um, um, uh, you know, decarbonisation and electrification. If you can recognise those opportunities that have been created by the ESG requirements that are building, you know, that's where the future is. It's an amazing time to be alive and a stimulus all around the world. You know, to go through this amazing and very strange and different pandemic that's stimulus to get countries back on track, low interest rate in environments and you know, the electrification and decarbonisation of everything. I'd like to welcome everybody to another one-to-one -one APAC online content session. Uh, today we have our investment strategies webinar, and I would like to welcome Matt Fifield, Managing Partner at Pacific Road Capital, David Franklin, Head of Funds Management at Argonaut, Rick Squire, Portfolio Manager for Resources and Energy at Acorn Capital, and um, on audio, we also have Nick Farr Jones, Director at Taurus Funds Management. So thank you everyone for taking part in this webinar today. And I would like to just mention to uh, everybody in the audience that are listening in, we are accepting questions from, from the audience today. So definitely feel free to type in any questions you have for our panelists in the Q&A box and I will get to them as we go through our discussion. We've also accepted questions ahead of time from the audience, and those have been uh, pretty well integrated into my question set already. So yeah, definitely feel free to type in your questions. Let's make it interactive. And I suppose we can get started. And so um, to kick things off, what are the, some of the key drivers of this commodity super cycle? How long do you think it's going to last? Is rising demand for raw materials and what, you know, a perceived lack of supply creating a new commodity super cycle? And to be honest, we, we, we got a, a question from the audience as well. Is there really such a thing as a super cycle? So I can leave it up to one of you to kick things off. Maybe uh, Matt, if you'd like to begin. Sure. Great. Thanks, Amy. And thanks for listening in, everyone. And um, the, the, the core question around, is this a commodity super cycle? I, I think it's actually a very perceptive question from the audience. Is there such a thing? What you have is you have periods of time where there's investment and you get step-like capacity ads into, uh, into a market. And then you have a gradual, uh, uh, you're also fighting gradual increases in productive capacity from advances in technology and and on the on the negative side of that everything is everything gets deeper everything gets further away from portals and you're fighting kind of both natural attrition in uh in costs and and today reserve degradation is uh you know in terms of percentage grade are things that people are working so you know you always have step functions and you have times when people want to grow and then you have times when people are uh, consolidating and playing it safe. I actually think one of the most interesting things um, that, that drives this market are people. And if you look at the current crop of managers, most people remember in 2012, 2013, 14, where most of today's CEOs and senior managers remember that their companies were fighting for survival with uh, over levered balance sheets and an uh, unappreciative market, very hard to form capital. And so for the last 10 years, we've really been in this cycle where people are very cautiously moving forward with organic growth um, and you know, reining in non-essential expenditures like exploration. And guess what? <clears throat> that comes home when the project pipeline is empty. And so the things that we're focused on right now is there's actually not a lot of middle, middle managers and talented people in the pipeline to drive an equally thin group of new greenfield uh, uh, you know, capacity expansions. And then there's not a lot, most of the brownfield expansions have happened over the last 
the obvious ones over the last five to 10 years. So you're at a place where the cupboard's a little bit bare. There's not a lot of people that have been out there pushing this and everything is still a little bit harder. So we're seeing right now, whether it's in valuations or market support or all of the rest, the, the logical outcome of that, which is people are shifting back towards growth uh, across, and one of the other panelists can handle what commodities and why, but in general, as people are looking towards growth and saying, right, we're, we're getting growth signal, let's, let's, let's grow, they go, well, actually, we don't have the people or we don't have the projects or we can form the capital, but it's going to take us seven years to go. So there's a series of challenges around growth that people are facing right now. That's what drives that kind of cyclical behavior of everybody tries to grow from the same macro signals and everybody is conservative under the same mac macro signal. So hopefully that, that answers your question. I, Amy, I'll kick in if you like. Um, you know, to me, a super cycle kind of implies that all commodities are, are in an uptrend. And, you know, I think uh, if you look longer term, I think it's going to be more nuanced than that. I think there's some commodities that are going to perform well and there's some commodities that won't perform well. And I think broadly, the way I look at it is sort of short term and long, and long term. In the short term, you've got, you know, the massive stimulus, you've got the pent up demand, uh, and that's flowing through to uh, demand for commodities. And at the same time, you've got constraints on supply and that's forcing up price. Um, and, that's, and that's good and that's what we're seeing now. I think long-term is a really exciting thing where you've got that, uh, that transition to clean energy. Um, you've got, um, um, you know, the decarbonisation of the power sector. You've got the electrification of the transport sector. And that's where, where we see... Um, the commodities that are going to perform well are those that are aligned to, the, to that key theme, uh, you know, such as lithium and copper and, and nickel and rare earths, et cetera. So, um, so we think it's nuanced. There's commodities you want to be in and there's commodities you don't want to be in. For example, iron ore, thermal coal, you know, I wouldn't be calling a super cycle in those commodities. And what are the commodities that um, you think are going to be kind of the, the drivers of that growth right now? Um, well, so so from that green energy transition, I think it's you know it's copper, it's nickel, it's uh, it, it's um, you know the graphite, um, 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 you know etc. It's it's a it's a battery, uh, the battery metal. If I could just follow on, and firstly, it's it's Nick here from Sydney. Um, apologies, Amy, to you and to um, my fellow participants, and also the viewers and. Um, participants in this in this virtual call apologies that I've got a, a bunk camera at the moment so it's just an audio from me but just to follow on from that I do think it's going to be various commodities will be driven by by different cycles but you know as the guys have said there's no doubt it's you know the, the stimulus packages that are going on around the world it's the decarbonization that's been mentioned I mean we've just had the G7 meeting in the UK plus four and you know it's just the political and government policy decisions, which are going to, you know, just drive the decarbonisation and and sequestration that we're we're witnessing now, and just the pressure on various governments to sort of get in boot step and um, in line with those policies. And you know, as as was just mentioned, um, you know, copper is going to be probably one of the commodities to watch. Anything involved in the, the electrification, not just of the of the automobile industry, but effectively the electrification of everything. I mean, the people next door to me in the sleepy suburb of East Linfield in Sydney, um, I've been talking to the builders, it's been a long build, and they said, you wouldn't believe how many electric switches and what have you are going into that house. That is common now. You know, I've got four kids between 30 and 21 years of age. If they're building anything, it's, it's hugely electrified compared to, you know, when I was probably building a house, you know, 30 and 40 years ago. And so the world is changing very quickly. And uh, of course, we've got following the, you know, the dreadful pandemic, global pandemics, we've got these enormous stimulus pack packages which just about every government um, is involved in because of the low interest rate environments. They can borrow enormous amounts of money and afford to service that. And so that's going into, into you know, stimulus packages, into infrastructure. Um, it's obviously driven a number of commodity prices like iron ore. Um, we're seeing a, a response from metallurgical uh, coal, but, you know, just, most of the base metals, and I don't know if we've got time, Amy, but we probably get onto things like fertilizers, um, phosphates, and uh, silicon, and and potash products, which again, you know, when you look at 
the urbanisation of the world and the need to feed the world, I think we're going to see, you know, the fertilisers, and we've already seen it in the last year, but significant increases in, in those prices as well. I'll uh, jump in. It's uh, uh, Rick here. So, yeah, look, I, I agree with all, all, all those thematics. We're, we're uh, pretty much seeing from the same song, song sheet here, the, 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 the panellists. Uh, you know, I think, you know, this time around, if you look back at the last one and, and uh, uh, David pointed on it about uh, iron ore, that the, the, the last super cycle was very much about the urbanisation of China and, 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 and it was that, that steel production that was required for, for that growth. So it was a very different... Um, Cycle, but the you know the, the 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 message that we're hearing from the other panelists is you know that uh, that transition to the to the low carbon economy and, and the metals that are going to facilitate that transition, you know that's where the opportunity lies lies this time. But the really interesting thing is that's not a space that the the the, the big uh, the big resources companies like BHP and 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 uh, Rio and FMG uh, uh, typically play in. You know they they're, they're sort of you know bulk commodities and 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 uh, you know, just, uh, you know, your big volume, small margin opportunity, whereas, whereas you, you get into the metals like, you know, the, the, the rare earth elements, the uh, lithium, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot trickier, uh, that, that, that space. It's, it's, you know, there's a lot of refining experience to, to, to get it down to that, that, that end, end product. And so, so that the technical skills and the mining skills are, are, are very different to, to what those uh, large players will, will be. And then for, for investors, you know that that brings challenges as well. That uh, you know you can really like uh, a space. You know we've seen some you know examples in the in the last uh, last few months in the rare earth space where you know companies have had projects that look really good on paper in terms of the uh, you know the grades of the projects. Yet there's been a collapse in the share price because of you know social issues that have uh, pushed back because of their uh, the, the amount of uranium that's in in some of these uh, uh, projects that we're seeing. You know, rare earth projects that have you know elevated amounts of uranium thorium in the minerals that they have to mine because they mine these unusual minerals like monazite and bastocite. Uh, so, so it's not something you can actually extract economic value out of it. It's more that nu nuisance value in terms of uh, uh, waste disposal and materials handling issues that that, that come with that. And th and then there's very large capex around this. So for a a single asset company to start up a project that's, you know, sort of a billion or two billion dollar capex, you know, that's a, a, a monumental feat for them to, to, to overcome. And as Matt pointed out at the front, you know, the, the, that middle level of uh, technical expertise in, 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 in developing that style of project is, is incredibly thin on the ground. There aren't many people to, to do that. So, so while we really like the, the, the opportunity, that the, the ability to execute on, on, on some of those, those uh, uh, projects is going to be a real challenge. And, that, and that's a, a real minefield for, for, for investors that you may love the thematic, you, know, you may pick something that looks good on paper, but uh, the technical challenges and the know-how to, 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 to actually execute on that plan, that's one of the, uh, the, the, the real challenges for, for, for all of us in this space. Rick, um, Rick, I thought you made a really good point on, on ex how you get exposure. Um, and I think what's fascinating is if, if, you, if you're a passive investor in the market, in the Australian market, in the resource sector, you're essentially getting an exposure to BHP, Rio, FMG, maybe a couple of oil and gas companies and maybe a, a gold company or so because, because they dominate the index, the resources index. Um, so I think it's, it's, a, it's a time for active investors who can target uh, those particular opportunities, you know, in copper and nickel or, or, or battery materials. And um, I think that's a really important point for investors looking at the sector and how they can gain exposure to the sectors of the market that are likely to outperform over the next decade. I guess, uh, I feel like last year there was discussion about uh, more generalist investors coming into the industry. Has that sentiment shifted now? No, I mean, look, if you think about, think about the capital raising uh, that's been happening over the last, uh, oh, you know, seven to nine months within the sector, started off with gold, there was profit taking in gold that shifted into, uh, you know, the rest of uh, the rest of the mining sector, including, uh, large caps, which were showing a lot of value, including 
battery metals, which have been, and copper, which have all been on a big run. And when you look at sort of the broad-based recommendations from the bulge bracket firms and asset allocators everywhere, that that thought of inflation, that thought of recovery, who's going to, you know, who's going to win out of this, who's driving recommendations towards commodities for all investors. So the scope of investors that are interested in this sector has widened and, so, and for, for a variety of reasons. Like David was saying, it could be decarb or electrification, could be inflation, could be uh, pure value. These, you know, a lot of companies that we look at are still, you know, to somewhere between two and four times, uh, um, you know, cash flow or, or or EBITDA. And so the valuation metrics versus other sectors still remain very interesting, particularly when you look at the, the growth aspects of it. So generalists are here. They are interested and then I think, you know, David, your, your thought was actually really, uh, it's, it's bang on. The question for investors on this call are, how do you want to play this, right? And there's a durational question. Are you waiting for the market to show up? Because one thing is going to be true is uh, electric vehicles will both not show up and show up too fast in, in varying amounts. So there's going to be continued volatility, just like we saw in 2018 around uh, around lithium, where there's going to be this great need for capacity, then it's not going to work, and then it's going to work. So are you are you looking at being there for some of that shorter term volatility that's sure to happen? Or are you looking to be there for a longer term three to five year play? Because how you look at the sector, I think, really uh, can be quite differentiated. You could be looking for very technical driven thesis like Rick does and saying, here's a good project and a good management team. And I think this project is going to unfold. You could look at it uh, uh, like we do saying, you know, this tide is moving in this direction. Who's the best position to be the incumbent and the consolidator and how can we help them achieve a bigger footprint and vision of what to be. And so <clears throat> there's really, there are, there, there are a lot of different ways, depending on if you want to uh, be in it for short-term pops. This is, I think the next, First of all, I'm just so happy to be alive right now. It's just a very interesting time in the markets with massive changes going on. But uh, but over the next three to five years, you'll see these pockets of volatility where everything looks great and everything looks bad and everything looks great. And that will present uh, opportunity to trade that volatility. And companies will be about to build their project and fall on their swords or they'll build their project and it won't work or all this normal kind of vol volatility is going to be amplified by the amount of people that are watching this sector. And, uh, and so that's that's one aspect. And the other one is that the world just simply is moving. It, it just requires more uh, from the mining sector to achieve the goals that it wants. And therefore it's a very exciting growth trend. Um, and, and I think for the individual investors, they should think about how do they wanna play that? Do they wanna play both sides of that or one side only? Um, and then the other, the other aspect is companies should be understanding what their shareholder base is expecting of them as they think to grow themselves um, and be courting one type of an investor or another. Just to follow on from that, uh, Matt, I mean, I think you're spot on there. And um, I do think we will see continued volatility in a generally increasing commodity market. But one area where I think the world uh, can take some surety is that we will be in a low interest rate environment for the next couple of years, even yeah. as we see potential for inflation to start kicking in. I can't see central banks um, because of the vulnerability of, of countries and the debt out there, both household and government debt. I can't see interest rates rising for the next couple of years. And, and that obviously will play out in, in, in relation to investment and, and generalists and specialists looking for for real assets. I mean, you can't park your money in the bank and expect to get anything more than 1% these days. And so, you know, everyone out there is looking for, you know, a return of, of 4 to 5% and upwards and um, real assets and particularly commodities and, and mining assets, mining companies um, really come into play in that sort of an environment. Yeah, it's interesting, Nick, just thinking about your business model and some of the varying uh, uh, questions or, or investors that are looking for us. Some people are thinking about inflation and they really want cash flow yield out of assets. And, uh, and so the dividend component that you see, whether it's in stocks or, uh, or, or whatever, is a real 
driver for people that are just, you know, hey, send me more money and something that's got a, a commodity top line that gives me some amount of insulation. I assume that that'd be true in your business and other people are really looking at it as a total return of, can we, you know, can we make a small bet on a lithium miner and make 5X our money, you know? So that strategy differentiation, I think each person in this call has a slightly different viewpoint on, on what they offer in the marketplace as well, which is interesting. Yeah, you're right, Matt. I mean, the Taurus model is, you know, we, we did manage equity um, and invest in, in the early funds that we manage, but uh, for the last sort of eight years, we've switched into into credit funds or debt. So typically project finance and acquisition finance is, is where we focus. And so it really comes down for, for us, not so much the return, albeit often we have what we call a structured equity piece, which can be a royalty, it could be a warrant. Um, it could be the ability to monetize offtake. Um, that will benefit from expansions of, of projects that we've led to, it will benefit from a rising commodity price, of course. But really what our focus is to, and we've got a very strong you know, due diligence committee, um, it's all about the rocks. It's all about the whole body. It's all about the due diligence on that, um, you know, the mine plan, getting that right. Of course, you know, management is, is critical and, um, you know, building a project that, you know, is commissioned on time, on budget, that's all critical. But, you know, our focus is really on payback um, and in servicing that debt to get the money back to our investors. And, and that's the critical thing for us. But, you know, returns will be enhanced typically um, in a rising commodity price and, you know, where there's an expansion of the project which we've financed. Yeah, we're totally on the other side of the spectrum from you where, you know, it's just it's just interesting. We're, we're looking at the, we're, we're, you know, I think it starts to tip a little bit, Amy, into ESG. Um, where what we're what we're thinking about is how to help build the companies that are going to be able to satisfy into the you know the demand of the future and so we're intensely focused on people and operating systems and one of the things that we've been banging the table on for a long time is uh, is ESG and in fact ESG disclosure interaction with investors around their need to understand material risks and how you manage them and so as you think about you know as we're kind of working in a in a concentrated investment fashion or in a growth equity investment fashion to work with management teams to grow their business that ESG factor uh, for us is just is even more paramount now that to David and Rick's point um, uh, you actually have the governments weighing in and providing as a capital provider or an enabler and you're seeing the end market moving into some of these sectors you know car manufacturers are going to be owning well, do on nickel projects, and that's that's a trend that's only going to continue. Eventually, the oil and gas sector is going to wade in because the electrification, they're just going to need more control over the upstream sector. And so to position for those, uh, uh, particularly the consumer-facing strategic partners, you need to be really tight on how you think about and disclose your material risks because they're, you know, they, they, they want to buy... Um, uh, ethically produced, um, environmentally uh, uh, conscious materials that they are then selling into their consumer base. So that kind of disclosure paradigm and uh, is just exceedingly important today. I don't know, David or Rick, if you guys are are thinking about that when you're investing. Yeah, certainly. We, we, we think about it a, a lot. It's really encouraging to, to hear that, Matt, that uh, you know, we, we've thought about this a lot and we have a lot of internal discussion about the, the the implications of the the, the ESG and particularly you know we, we we're talking today about resources but even in energy that uh, you know we, we talk about energy and, and I think it was David mentioned at the start it might be Matt was you know thermals a more difficult space to to, to invest in today I and mean, we see that as a you know there's certainly a, a, a strong element of that that stranded asset risk that it might be you might have a great thermal asset in, in Australia but the market will essentially would view it like it's a project in Afghanistan, that they'll they'll never fully value it. So it's just from a raw investment perspective, let, let alone an uh, environmental or, or, or social perspective, but a raw investment perspective, it, it's not going to get that full valuation. So, so and it's only going to decline with time. And and so then we look at the other... Uh, the, the other Rick, Rick, just on that, which, which I, I believe that in the next couple of years, we're going to see most of those thermal coal projects that are often held by massive international companies. I think we'll see um, the privatisation of those assets. Agree. Oh, I strongly agree. That, that, that's... Without disclosure requirements, um, just print a lot of money. 
Yeah, so that that that's where that's where it'll be. So then, when we look at the energy uh, sector, you say, well, well, people go, well, the, the same thing's going to happen to to oil and gas. But you know, the the the, the point that we we really emphasised is that you know this is very much a transition to the uh, to the low carbon economy. It's not a giant step tomorrow, and and it's really important, uh, you know, if, if it'll eventually come out that uh, you know it, it's it's one of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals is about the provision of clean and affordable energy for everyone. So it's, you know, it's people in Africa, but it's also the, you know, the not so wealthy uh, Australian uh, citizens that we've got to provide the cleanest and most affordable energy for, for everyone in the world. And so, so there's very much a transition. So, so when you look at oil and gas, I think there still is a future for, for oil and gas, but we'll be looking for oil and gas sets that have a, a low carbon footprint. Go, well, what does that mean? It's like, well, you know, some of these uh, oil shale projects will be, you know, le le less appealing than, than a conventional oil project or, or, or a, uh, a gas project with low CO2 emissions versus, you know, those with high CO2 emissions. So, so there'll, there'll actually be a nuance that will come out. And so for investors that are aware of this, it creates a really good opportunity because the demand will still be there. The demand will be there in the, in the short to near term. But if you if if, if you can recognise those opportunities that have been created by the, you know the the, the ESG requirements that are building, you know that's where the the, the, the future is. And so we think you, that you you can actually invest in uh, energy, you can invest successfully, uh, but but you need to be really acutely aware of of, of where those ESG uh, uh, requirements are going. And, and um, I guess this is for all of you. Do you follow specific metrics when looking at ESG or is it kind of what are the factors that you really look at uh, when measuring ESG of a company? That uh, so I can jump in on that. You know, we've identified eight key criteria that we screen as part of our investment process and our ongoing engagement and monitoring process. Um, some of those are actually just flat out legal requirements like, uh, uh, say, uh, corruption in human rights. Um, and other of those are uh, regulated affluence. Um, uh, I mean, they're, 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 so there's an entire range that we that we look at. Uh, and in general, what we're trying to do is push people towards what we think are benchmarks that are being set externally. We There's enough different criteria that we don't need to set up our own criteria and we recognize like Rick was saying it's a journey so we're pushing people towards this journey and then working with management and boards to say are you headed on this journey correctly are you telling people about it um, uh, and, and ultimately tie compensation into that because we think as a as an investor it creates a better set of strategic options and it creates a more resilient company um, if I can, if I can jump in, just to, Rick, the one thing that you said that that's going on right now that's really intense for us in, in a thought process and discussion is there has been such a move towards net zero by uh, uh, everyone from governments to you know large industrials and all of the rest. And net zero, what that really means is most of the people that make things are using raw materials, and it's something like. 70, 80% of people that make things, their emissions are actually scope three emissions. And the people that, that dig things, 70% of their emissions are kind of scope one and scope two, things that are in their control. So we're working very intensely with our portfolio companies to try to, you know, basically thinking about our customers' customers, which is how do you help these people that are making those net zero commitments achieve them in the best way. And, and you're seeing differentiated business models. I can think of three nickel companies that are net zero nickel companies. I can think of, you know, and, and, and that's, that's a, that, it, that is a last six months um, intensification of effort within our portfolio and more broadly just around people that are differentiating saying, if you buy something produced by our mine, it will give you the lowest footprint. And here's how we track, verify, um, and move on. So beyond Amy, I guess beyond our internal metrics, what we look at ourselves, we're also really encouraging investee and portfolio companies to think about what can they do to track and provide those metrics to other people because it sets a stage for a more successful run. Just following off on that, Matt, to uh, the whole concept of net zero, um, 
I'm not sure if many people sort of just track and follow the um, what carbon credits are trading for now and uh, the trends there, and uh, but particularly in Europe, um, significantly higher than a year ago. And so that's going to be an interesting space to watch. But I was just reading something uh, just over the weekend, um, how you have set off some companies that are focused on net zero. And, you know, I was just reading how Sojis, the big Japanese player, who've got the Gregory Cronum uh, coal project in Queensland, how 300 kilometres inland from Brisbane, they're building this massive uh, solar plant, um, which will provide both power to to the mine, but also will set off the carbon footprint that they've created. So I think you're going to see these big organisations, big institutions, looking at ways that they can set things off. I know one of the big coal players globally is looking at ways that it can actually, from its coal, um, put it through a process which still has to be proven to be economically beneficial, but you can create syngas and out of that you can create hydrogen out of that. So I think a lot of even the big coal miners are going to be looking at that new technology, the new processes that go into creating from whether it's biomass, whether it's coal, whether it's plastics, anything with a carbon footprint in it that can then produce, you know, hydrogen or syngas. Um, the whole, you know, race at the moment is can it be done economically as opposed to, um, you know, sort of non-economically. That's a really good point, Nick. Uh, you know, when I... I, I look at the energy companies today. I, I see a great opportunity in, in that you know that future energy space. That you know maybe they're just going to pivot to, towards you know hydrogen. That they've got that uh, that they've got that expertise a, a lot in, in 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 many respects. You know particularly the big oil and gas companies. You know if you're going to go for you know, offshore geosequestration, they've already got big reservoirs and they've got you know the infrastructure that, that that's offshore and they've got the expertise over many decades decades in some cases of actually you know doing some of this um uh, geo sequestration and and therefore you know is there just a you know a build on for that that they then start producing whether it's a, a blue hydrogen or green hydrogen or whatever that you know i think there's actually a, a really a, a, a exciting opportunity the, the 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 only caveat to that you know you know you always think about the you know the the balancing up the the argument is you know not to be swept up by too much of the hype that you know a lot of this the you know, green hydrogen as you mentioned it's it's not economic at the, at the moment and uh, you know it could be you know 10 20 or 30 years before it is and so as an investor that there's you know opportunities we see out there in, in hydrogen goes oh this is fantastic this is really visionary stuff but uh, but am I going to make any money in the next 10 years? And, and uh, as an investor, you've got to be very careful when, when going down that path. But that you, you may, it's, it's all good to say you were visionary and you saw it and you invested in it. But if you, if you failed to make any money, any return on it, well, you know, that that's, you know, it hasn't been a, a great opportunity. But the bigger companies that have, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the big energy companies, they can take that longer term uh, vision and, and, and do that. And so, so it will be a, a difficult space to, to invest in, in, in. Particularly, I think hydrogen is a difficult space to, to invest in because, you know, the, it's, a, it, it's the, the timelines are, are so long and, and you know, the, the cost of, of staying alive and, and developing all that research will, will, will be enormous for some. And so, you know, it's very careful in terms of how you play that. Hey, Amy, if I can just add, add to that. I mean, I think um, when people talk ESG, there's a lot of discussion around the E and probably less discussion around the S and the G, you know, the social and government, governance. And I think, um, I think what we've seen with Rio, for example, in their Jungan Gorge um, disaster is that, you know, how companies deal with the communities, the First Nations, how they deal with their workforce, um, and then how they report and, and I guess the commitment that you see from the boards and the management is also really important. And I think we're moving more and more where an investor wants to see a very transparent approach to the whole ESG um, combination. And, um, you know, they want to see an auditable supply, um, supply channel um, where they're really tracking what's happening with the commodity from when it's dug out of the ground to when it's delivered to market. And I think that's, you know, that's, um, that's a really good thing. And probably leading on from that, it's a really great opportunity for the resource sector in general. I mean, if you look at the, the, the perception of resources historically, it, it's, you know, it's kind of pillaging, digging stuff out of the ground, being pretty inefficient, um, not really worrying about, you know, how they're treating their people or the communities and selling it into the market. Whereas I think 
the, the nature and the perception of mining can really change where you're seeing a total focus on ESG and delivering efficient and, uh, and green uh, products into the market. And I think, um, I think that's uh, a real opportunity for the resource sector to become that integral component in the supply chain, which really changes the world as far as um, um, uh, you know, decarbonisation and electrification. You bring up supply chains, and I know one of the big topics um, over the course of 2020 was about um, starting to integrate supply chains and having um, commodity supply chains become a little bit more regionalized. Um, how do you see that impacting uh, investment or decision making on your end? Look, it is full on right now. Okay, if you step back uh, and you think about where 2019 U.S. China trade wars, uh, 2020 people are concerned that they're going to run out of critical inputs, um, and there's this you know obviously everything that happened in 2020. I don't need to recount, but there's just this there's a huge focus on as you're shutting down or as you're starting. Do I have adequate stocks, uh, and where am I getting my supply from, and is there a potential that I won't be able to do that? And what you've seen is, again, this is the place where the uh, state governments, uh, where states and governments are really weighing in. G7, they're talking about a counter to Belt and Road backup. You've got Australia, U.S. on critical minerals. You've got uh, you know, U.S., Canada, Europe, Canada, uh, the European Battery Alliance, the European Raw Materials Initiative, DFC um, revamp in the U.S., just pushing out, looking uh, for to invest both domestically and within coordinations around um, supply chains, executive orders from Biden, uh, commentary, critical minerals task force from Morrison. I mean, this is so topical right now. And if you are not aware of it as an investor uh, or a company, you're missing out on a huge portion of the dialogue that is happening right now. Through this, you will find access to national champions, Daimler, Ford, GM, um, you know, LG, uh, 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 cattle, you know, whomever it is. This game, this is the greatest game of, of a generation being played right in front of us right now. And so the supply, the thing that I think is very interesting is that the Europeans are well in front of the U.S. for the moment in terms of creating a, uh, a model through which they can provide finance and access materials to support their their emerging low carb uh, low carbon energy economy. And the U.S. is moving very quickly in that direction, but is lagging Europe. And they're actually two separate blocks, which is notable in of itself because it used to be, you know, West versus East, and now it's Europe versus. Uh, uh, you know, U.S. versus uh, China, it's every man for himself. And so that there's kind of a, um, you know, three separate blocks. So this is a huge focus when you when you go to whether you're picking stocks or buying companies or growing a company, you know, know that investors are looking at, do you have a, uh, you know, are you wholly reliant on offtake from uh, Eastern interests? Or do you have a plan to go to the West? So the business models are, are evolving. Spherical graphite plants in the U.S. We get, you know, one a week crossing our desk in terms of people that are looking to onshore things in the U.S. or on, onshore things in Europe. So supply chains and, and processing and everybody's kind of working on it. This is the conversation of the day. You know, you have to you have to be aware of it as an investor and you have to be participating in it as a producer. It's not just about pounds in the ground. It's where those pounds go. Does anyone else have a follow up on that? Um, if not, we can get to some of our questions from the audience. Amy, I'll I'll one like comment to follow on from. No, no, you go, David. Oh, thanks, Nick. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, look, look, two points. I think obviously with the with the tensions with China as their economy continues to grow, you know, we're seeing that shift from total globalization to sort of almost a deglobalization, or at least a, a protection. And and we're seeing that on both sides. I mean, China, for example is actively looking to build um, alternative supplies of iron ore, um, whereas you know, um, places like Australia and, and elsewhere are looking, are looking for new markets. I think the other aspect to that though is, is really, you know, if, we go, if, if, if you're gonna be an efficient producer of commodities, then you probably need to do 
uh, a further level of processing. And I think lithium is a really good example of that. You know, at the moment, Australia is a big producer of lithium. You know, it's, 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 it's hard rock and we produce a you know, lithium concentrate, which is about 6%. So, you know, essentially we're exporting a lot of dirt. Um, and I think what we need to do is we need to do more processing. So we're, we're more efficient and we're reducing, you know, uh, global emissions. And um, so I think, I think both those aspects, one is, is um, politically it makes sense um, to have greater control and, tra and, and, um, and transparency on the supply chain. But secondly, there's still work to be done to make sure that the industry is as efficient, efficient as possible. Nick, did you have a, a follow-up as well? Yeah, look, look, Amy, just one other thing, you know, just in relation to the building of projects, particularly large projects, you know, that might be owned by companies with, you know, smaller market caps. And, and we all know that if there's a big capital spend, then it's a huge challenge for a, a small developing company to, to actually be able to finance that project. But I think around the world, you're seeing the emergence of government and quasi-government funds and, and funding institutions. Um, here in Australia, of course, you've got um, NAIF, you've got the North, Northern Australian Infrastructure Fund, which is you know, doing some significant funding, of course, in the north of the country. You've got organisations like the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. You know, anything that you know, has a smell of green or you know, decarbonisation to it will, will quickly get funding from those organisations. You've got QIC in Queensland, where the government sees a strategic opportunity, particularly in minerals, um, that they'll get funding from those sort of organisations. And that's going on globally now. Um, so I think that will have a very positive impact on supply going forward um, to be able to access those funds for long terms at very cheap borrowing costs. And so um, to move on to some of the questions from the audience before we wrap it up, um, it kind of shifts the topic a little bit, but um, so somebody asked, how do company valuations compare when looking at different markets? So something like ASX for versus TSX listed. Is this, um, is this something that, that, that you consider? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think, you know, the, the, the global nature of markets means in general that um, th there's, there's not sustainable arbitrage opportunities between markets. Um, uh, I think it can vary on, on commodities, you know, so I think if you look at the gold sector, um, you know, it's probably pretty well priced, um, you know, by, by market. Uh, often it's the companies that are bigger and, you um, and have long, you know, long life minds that uh, that are the ones that get the bigger ratings. Um, if you if you're not getting the the um, the passive investors into your stock, but you know potentially there's um, there's a lower valuation there. Copper is a really interesting example because um, you know everyone's looking for copper exposure, but in Australia there's there's very limited exposure on the ASX. So you've got Oz Minerals, which is a, a high quality stock, but it, it probably trades at, a, at the top end of global, you know, copper stocks, just because um, there's not a lot of alternatives. Um, so I think it can, it can vary. Um, um, you, Rick, don't know if you've got any, anything you would add there. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd just uh, extend your comment about uh, copper. There, there, there's actually a a geological bias between the resource composition, yeah. uh, you know, in North America versus Australia. You, you, you've, uh, David's just pointed out uh, copper, but uh, you look at silver, and and uh, there's quite a, a few s silver explorers, developers, and 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 uh, numerous producers in in North America, and, and it's largely driven by you know it's a big subduction zone that creates the the Andes and the Rockies, and so you have a lot of these polymetallic mines, whether they're they're, they're, they're gold, silver, or, or commonly these uh, lead, zinc, silver deposits, these VMS uh, projects, and it's a little bit like you know we have a lot of iron ore in the in the Pilbara. You see a lot in um, in, in in Brazil, and and there's uh, a reasonable amount in in, in uh, West Africa as uh, as well. So there are pockets of the world where you get these uh, the, the, these biases. So uh, in, in terms of you know how we think about it, you know we 
at, at Acorn, we, we invest largely in, on, on the ASX, but we, we have an opportunity to, to look at other markets, but we use that as a, an opportunity to, to seek out uh, uh, um, opportunities where there are, uh, are, um, uh, are shortages in the Australian market. So, so as David mentioned, there's uh, plenty of gold in North America and, and in Australia. So the way I think about it is, we don't worry about uh, 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 North America for gold, but if we're looking for silver exposure or copper exposure, well, we use that as our vehicle to, to, to go in. So it's not really a, the, the, the question that was asked by the audience member. I'm not answering uh, the, the, the question uh, directly, but but uh, that that's how um, you know we think about it. Is you know there are these uh, geological biases, and you've got to be aware of that. And so rather than than uh, you know, investing in a company that you don't like with a poor quality asset uh, in Australia, our preference is to, to use that to, to look elsewhere, whether it be, you know, AIM listed or, or, or TSX, but generally it's uh, North American um, uh, markets to, to, to look for those opportunities. And we are actually nearing the, um, the end of the webinar. And so I suppose the last question really is, um, actually, we've, we've got a, a question from the audience uh, relating back to the decarbonization theme um, that we can look at. So what's your view on the role of carbon capture, utilization and storage? And how soon can we expect it to become a major player towards the net zero emission goal? Oh, uh, look. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, it, it's. Uh, I, I think it's a really interesting question. There's a, a, a couple of issues there that uh, you know we, we've seen with uh, 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 fracking that you know onshore. I think it will be uh, uh, difficult for, for, from a social perspective uh, for, for for the, uh, the, the the risks around that. And uh, but you know uh, uh, you know carbon capture. You know there has been you know geosequestration has been occurring in the industry for a while in the in in the oil and gas industry, but. But uh, you know, to, to go the extension of that, you know, that that's a you know on a large scale, that that'll be interesting because you know that will feed into this, you know, the blue hydrogen where you produce your hydrogen, but you you capture the CO two and then you <laughs> you store it in in some way, and and that's why I think there's a really 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 good opportunity for some of these big uh, um, existing oil and gas companies that they've got the existing infrastructure rather than drawing it um, you know, just offshore and bringing it onshore, you actually send send some of it back and, and they they understand their reservoirs really well they they, they understand the, the, the process of reinjection uh, very well so it's really just an extension of of, of, uh, of what it is they're already doing and, and that's where I, I, I think there's you know there's there's great opportunity I, I, I can't remember it was Nick or Matt mentioned it before that uh, you know I think there's you know some some in-house expertise, you know, that's been developed over the, the decades that can that, that can be extended in that space. So, so it's not something in the, in, in the near, near term, but I think you know there's genuine opportunity. And just to follow on from that, I, I certainly know that the Australian government sees carbon capture um, is just as important as um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions to read our you know 2030 2050 um, targets. I mean, we don't they don't talk a lot about it. But certainly Angus Taylor, the energy minister, I've seen him um, in a number of statements uh, talk about the importance of carbon capture. I think recently the federal government even provided some funding. I think it was $50 million to you know, massive companies like Glencore and Santos to look at uh, developing processes for carbon capture. So in relation to meeting future targets, um, you know, our federal government has got uh, carbon capture right up there as a very high priority. Uh, for Australia and um, you know I think it's a great opportunity for this country um, as well as obviously reducing greenhouse em emissions and, and producing more renewable energy but the carbon capture um, in a country such as Australia is, is a tremendous opportunity. From my perspective we could fill an entire webinar on carbon capture um, there you know it's, it's a it's a fast-moving field and in some respects and in other respects it's the same principal issues. One, for sequestered carbon, it's very, very hard to find concentrated uh, CO2 that can be effectively pumped, liquidated, and injected underground. Two, the reservoirs, uh, uh, you know, geosequestration in oil and gas wells is very easily the most logical economic um, first step in, in making that more widespread. 
once you move beyond uh, oil and gas, enhanced oil recovery, uh, and geosequestration into old fields, the, the, you start to get in your question. The question from the audience was, when will we see it? You're going to see it now. And you're going to see a huge focus on it now. Um, and it's going to accelerate in areas where there are mature oil and gas basins first, and then move forward from that. So that is unavoidable. And it's all happening right now. But then when you move past uh, enhanced oil, and one of the biggest challenges is where to get the CO2 from. So there's a variety of people working on different technologies to concentrate CO2 atmospherically or to uh, concentrate uh, uh, CO2 from emission stacks. And there's, there's a whole field of people that are evolving around that. And then the other thing is you're looking at terrestrial uh, um, uh, soil uh, sequestration. You're looking at biochar and enhanced um, forest land. Uh, land management practices. There's a you know there's a whole number of evolving fields that end up with higher enhanced take up of carbon into the soil and different ways to deal with that. And then you're seeing people you know create algaes that are um, biodigesters of CO2. So there's a there's a whole scope around carbon and carbon capture. And the part that's inter in interesting is that uh, is that the enablers of that are being funded on an R&D basis, as Nick was saying, from, by the government. And you have a lot of smart people working on these problems. But it, is it happening? Yeah, it's happening now. And, it, and it's actually accelerating. And are the grounds being laid for the future? Absolutely, that is the case. And just to follow on very quickly, Matt, I know time's running out and this is a totally different topic, but it's why I think, you know, fertilisers uh, as a mining commodity as well have, you know, a very strong future. Um, that whole thing about photosynthesis that we learned at school, um, which effectively converts the carbon dioxide into oxygen. And, um, you know, fertilisers is all about better quality, but most importantly, better yield. And better yield means more photosynthesis effectively and carbon sequestration. So it's a whole new topic, fertilisers, but uh, it's something at Taurus that uh, we've got a little focus on. Well, interested to hear more about that, Nick, offline. Back to you, Amy. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everyone. I think um, we're, we're probably, um, you know, we have one more question from the audience, and I think we can um, use that really as a, um, a way to close things off. Um, so there seems to be very poor market recognition that most of the um, most of the global nickel production cannot be converted to EV grade nickel sulfate at today's nickel price. Um, so currently produced nickel, pig iron and ferro-nickel probably needs um, about US $10 per pound of nickel to be economically converted to EV nickel sulfate. Um, so the global production of EV suitable nickel is relatively small and there's a long supply chain nickel train wreck um, coming. Any comments on this? So yeah, what's I've, happening in the nickel space? How do we make uh, EV nickel at an economic price? Yeah, sure. There, there are a, a couple of options. Certainly the, the nickel sulfides that the Australians know quite well in terms of like the, uh, you know, the, the Western Australian uh, nickel mines around Cambalda, you know, they're, they're they're the ones that are actually suitable. The, the, as the, the, um, uh, the audience member uh, uh, pointed out, a, a lot of the others, you know, traditionally from the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the big nickel laterite uh, deposits, they, they carry, you know, elevated uh, levels of impurities and, 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 and they're just sufficiently elevated that they're, pr they're problematic for, for, for the, uh, uh, the batteries. Now, we've seen, uh, you know, Indonesia is a very, very big uh, producer from these uh, nickel laterite, but uh, Ting Chang re re recently came out and, and said that they've a, a process for producing a, a nickel mat that will then be able to be used. So, so there is work going on in terms of you know improving that technology. Now, now the, the, the caution around that is that you know they've done it at the uh, the laboratory scale, and and uh, anyone that has any experience in the industry knows that taking something from the laboratory and actually getting it to commercial uh, scale is, is is a gigantic step. It's uh, you know it's it, it's not just a simple uh, 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 a simple progression. And then 
so, so uh, yes, it, it, it is happening. Where you've got to be uh, careful, but uh, but um, you know, there certainly is a you know great opportunity as when you're thinking about nickel. That you know, not not all nickel deposits are the same, and that um, you know, if you can find some of these uh, ones like the Cambalda style, uh, you know, uh, massive sulphide uh, uh, projects, they're certainly the the appropriate um, uh, deposits for today. Uh, but just the caution around that is that you know technology is coming along. There, there is a price pressure, which is which, which, which there's a premium for for that that style of uh, uh, nickel product. That that uh, companies like uh, Ting Chang are, are, are trying to develop methods to take these nickel laterite to projects to produce uh, something that's suitable. And and you know BHP certainly uh, doing that in 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 WA as well. That they've got. You know, big H power plants producing their, their their product that they're actually trying to produce uh you know nickel sulfate as, as well. So it's uh you know there are a number of companies uh, doing it, but actually achieving that that's something that's still you know in 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 progress at at, at the moment. So uh, so it's a bit of a, a watch this space. Yeah. And so I mean, sorry, but I can just add that. Um, you know, I think what's interesting with uh, the Shenzhen announcement is is when, when they came out with that announcement, the nickel price, uh, you know, fell sort of 10 to 15%. Uh, but it's now pretty much back to where it was when that announcement came out. And I think I think the question is, would um, would the EV manufacturers actually, um, actually buy that supply source given the energy intensity to produce it? Um, and I think that's the question. I think fundamentally though, when you're investing in commodities, you want to be targeting the low cost producers. And uh, in the nickel space, um, if you're targeting the battery sector, they're the nickel sulfide producers. And I think, you know, Australia has a number of good ones, such as IGO, you know, Mincor are, are developing a project and some of the smaller ones. So that's really where, where we're focused and, and where we would suggest people should be focused. I suppose to, to wrap things up um, along that vein, really, you know, decarbonisation, green energy, um, electrification is really kind of taken over this discussion. Uh, do any of our uh, panelists today have any closing thoughts, um, key takeaways for the audience uh, to think about looking at this space? Uh, I'll always take up the opportunity for a closing argument, but I think that the, you know, if you step back and remember how this all started, we're in a volatile world, whether you're a nickel bull that just asked that question, uh, you think about what your timeframes are as an investor. And if you are looking to trade that volatility, be alert to it because it will be around and will continue to be volatile. I suspect it will be volatile up, which is that the directions that we're talking about here from electrification, decarbonization are just simply a much more metal intense world. And so therefore, as a core part of your investment holdings, this is a, you know, this is this is a feature. Of it should be a long-term feature with shorter-term volatility, where where you find opportunity to make money. Um, and one of the most common questions I have is: Is it too late? Has everything already moved? And I feel like we're just at the you know we're midway through the first quarter here, um, and there's actually quite a lot that will play out, and it will be choppy moments where it's not going to work, and and moments where it will work, but the you know the match will play on. So I would say I would say it's just a it's it's a great time to be thinking about this sector right now. Yeah, just to follow on from from what Matt said, and I think you know, during the course of this one hour chat, um, Matt said it's a good time to be alive in the commodity sector. Um, you know, for us, it's a great time to be financing the development of projects. Um, you know, at the moment, um, you know, it was a really interesting time when. China went from a net exporter to a net uh, importer of coal, as we all know, in the early 2000s, and their urbanisation program uh, drove millions out of, out of poverty and, uh, of course, consumed you know, metals that created that last super cycle. And uh, this super cycle will be driven by other things, but it's an amazing time to be alive, you know, stimulus all around the world. You know, to go through this amazing and very strange and different pandemic, but stimulus to get countries back on track low interest rate in environments and, you know, the electrification and decarbonisation of everything. Uh, it's an amazing time. It will be a different ride for different commodities. Um, but for some, it'll be a very, very interesting ride. And, you know, for some of those producers, it'll be the aligning of stars.
Yeah, I mean, I'll just add, you know, really, it's it's a multi-decade transition and we're in the early stages of that. So uh, I think there'll be volatility along the way, but um, it's, uh, you know, it's it's early days. Yeah, I just, uh, I, I agree. I, I think it's just a really exciting time and uh, like like Matt, I'm, I'm, I'm ha really happy to be alive and be part of it. Well, I think those are some uh, pretty positive sentiments to close off today then. Um, so I'd like to thank Thanks, all of our panelists for taking part today in this webinar. Uh, the one-to-one -one APAC event it, it effectively begins tomorrow morning. So if you are taking meetings or if you need um, assistance in setting up those meetings, definitely get in touch with the team. Um, and otherwise we look forward to welcoming you to the next APAC event, which would be um, October, early November of this year. And hopefully we'll be back at a live event, uh, an in-person event sometime soon. So thank you. All right, thanks. Thanks guys. Thank, thank you. Thanks Amy, thank you, thank you everyone.